Hello, everyone. Very happy to have you on the line today for the launch of the Navigating Impact Project Quality Jobs theme. Um, we are recording this webinar and we'll publish it on the education tab in the IRIS Plus website after this. You'll receive an email with that information. Um, we are going to, to walk through a little bit of background. Um, I'll actually show you the agenda now. Um, we'll give a little bit of background on the GINS Navigating Impact Project and IRIS Plus and walk through the quality jobs theme um, and then hear from uh, CDC Group and Charité Ventures, both of whom uh, have done a lot of work in the quality jobs space. And we'll speak to how they um, this work resonates with their approaches and how they'll plan to use the theme moving forward. We'll then be diving into a question and answer uh, session, and we're hoping to have quite a lively discussion. Please do feel free to submit questions um, in the, the questions tab on the, um, the dashboard that you see as we go along, and we will um, facilitate that um, once we get there. And then finally, we'll land on what's next for this particular theme, and we're excited about next steps, um, both on this theme and more broadly. So with that, let me pass this over to the GIN CEO, Amit Bori, to share a little bit more about the GIN and why this work is important. Great, thank you. Um, and um, I first, I just want to thank all of you for joining us here. Uh, you know, this work is incredibly important. Um, and we, are, of course, at our Essence RA network. Uh, and uh, the network has really been a part of shaping this work. And I do want to give a special thanks uh, to the over 150 uh, different folks who had, were part of developing um, you know, this portfolio of activities. And also a special thanks um, to the ILO and the ITC ILO um, for supporting this work with their expertise and perspective on it. Um, it's absolutely essential. Um, I wanted to um, you know, take a moment just to talk a little bit about why I think this work is so absolutely important at this moment in the world. Um, and I think given that you're all here to talk about quality employment and jobs, I think it's not something that um, you, know, you need me to tell you about, but I, I do think um, you know, this is something that we are, uh, is incredibly strategic for where the world is going. Um, and I'm so glad that we have such a great community of impact investors and, and, and business leaders and, and other technical experts who have helped shape this important work. Um, for the, the GIN, uh, for those of you who don't know, just briefly, um, we are a, a global network that's focused on increasing the scale and effectiveness of impact investing. Our network includes over 30,000 people all around the world. I'm active on six continents, uh, and we also have a formal membership that includes over 300 organizations based in 50 countries. Um, and these are investors, large and small, um, an incredibly diverse group, but who all share the conviction of putting their capital to work to have a positive impact on the world. Um, you know, obviously the, the world is contending with unprecedented crisis right now. Uh, and, you know, the, and everyone I think is waking up to realizations that are, um, you know, that are known to think everyone who's present on this conversation which is that um, you know, we have, are having many of the world's inequities exposed in an incredibly powerful and visceral way. Um, a couple of the themes um, that are really being highlighted, um, you know, is the um, the fact that um, you know people uh, had so many people had such fragile economic lives, um, and uh, of course that you know um, we often are uh, counting jobs when we think about economic indicators, but we know that not all jobs are alike. Um, and many people, though employed, have an incredibly vulnerable state despite their employment. Um, our vision for the world of the GIN um, is a world in which all investments consider social and environmental impact alongside their risk and return, where impact just becomes part of all investing. And on this work on quality employment, I think is a perfect example of why that is so important. You know, as the world looks to um, you know, build back from this crisis, um, and to recover from, from the, the COVID crisis that we're experiencing globally. I think it's absolutely critical that we put impact front and center um, for the way the world invests going forward. Um, and I think quality employment is an, a perfect example of what we need to do um, you know, to actually change the way that the world operates. And we want every investor to be thinking about not just the number of jobs, but the quality of jobs. You know, because it is so critical, as you all know, that a job creates an incredible impact at an individual level, at a family and household level, in a community, um, and in a national and global society. And so we're thinking about all the different things that stem from someone's economic livelihood and stability 
um, this work is so critical. Uh, and the work of IRS Plus is really helping investors you know, man, uh, translate their impact intentions into real impact results. Um, and building in this work into the IRS Plus system, I think is absolutely critical so we can guide the way that the uh, rapid growth of the impact investing community can focus in on how they can create um, quality em employment um, and really support the economic livelihoods of, of, of people all around the world. Um, so I'll turn it back to the team. And I do want to thank my colleagues, um, you know, Lisa and the entire team that works on navigating impact in IRS Plus uh, for their leadership on this work. Um, and we look forward to partnering with all of you, um, you know, through the public comment period and into um, the effort to incorporate this into the way the world invests. Thank you. Thank you, Ahmed. Um, that was a great introduction to what we'll talk about next, which is just what actually is in the Navigating Impact Project in IRIS Plus. Many of you are familiar with IRIS Plus, uh, the generally accepted system for measuring, managing, and optimizing impact. Um, and you may be wondering why I'm mentioning this while we're here for a launch of uh, a theme on the Navigating Impact Project. So, what I want to share is just a little bit about why IRIS Plus and the Navigating Impact Project uh, exist and how they relate. So as we know, uh, as many of you know from being practitioners within this space, there are a number of pain points in impact measurement and management in the impact investing ecosystem. Um, three of the, the most critical ones that we often hear is around lack of implementation guidance, lack of core metrics and comparable data, and continued confusion and fragmentation within the market. And these are exactly the three points that IRIS Plus was designed to solve for. Um, it's developed in alignment with over 50 standards. So instead of uh, reinventing the wheel, IRIS Plus very actively collaborates and integrates with um, a number of different standards. Uh, and it's designed to work with, um, with any of them and also to be uh, framework agnostic so that it can be used with any proprietary framework as well. You can see here a couple of the um, the frameworks that we are aligned with, but you can also see the full list and the tactical uh, metric to metric pieces on the IRIS Plus website. IRIS Plus as a system has been informed by well over 1,200 different stakeholders. Um, there are a couple of them on this slide just uh, as examples, but as you can see here, um, we've spoken with and engaged really a, a wide variety of experts, of asset owners, asset managers, service providers, enterprises, research institutions, um, and others in the development of this system. Um, what that means is that by the time uh, themes get to this point and to the point of launch in IRIS Plus, they've been looked at from a number of different angles, uh, tested for a lot of different uh, applications, and are, are recommended by the industry as a starting point for, uh, for impact measurement and management approaches within that space. When we talk about IRIS Plus, IRIS Plus is the ultimate landing place for all of this work, but it it's a long and, and involved process to get something on IRIS Plus. Um, so the Navigating Impact Project is actually how we, we power up and develop this, the, the thematic pieces that will end up in IRIS Plus. The point of the Navigating Impact Project is to bring together this expert subgroup. Uh, and as Ahmed mentioned, um, this quality jobs theme engaged the, uh, the biggest and the most engaged um, stakeholder group that we've had to date with well over 150 different actors. Um, we, through this process and with our, our, um, our partners, bring together a number of different actors uh, to, to talk about impact measurement and management norms, to talk about what's rigorous uh, and what's practical and to pull together clear metrics, guidance, overviews, and curated tools specifically for that, um, that point. So as you can see here, we are um, working on the Navigating Impact Project. We're launching today, so we're at that, um, that yellow arrow. From here, we'll move into a standardization and public comment period. And from there, it will launch into IRIS Plus. Um, if you are interested in, in continuing to be a part of this process or in joining us now, um, I'll provide a link as to how to do that in the, the coming slides. So today we are thrilled to be launching this quality jobs theme. This is what it looks like on the Navigating Impact Project website. And 
there is there are quite a number of themes that have already been developed. Um, the ones in the box at the top are ones that have made it all the way through this process to the Iris Plus system. You can see at the bottom left that we have a number that are in process right now. Um, today we're of course talking about quality jobs, but there are a couple of others that we're working on um, and invite you to be a part of if they are part of your, your practice and your interest area. And that's all on the background. Um, from here, I will pass it over to Monica, uh, I'm sorry, Patricia, to, to share a little bit more about this particular theme. Thanks, Lisa, for passing the microphone over to uh, to us at the ILO and the Training Center. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Um, the first thing that I would really like to do is actually echoing what Amit said. Thank you, Lisa, for guiding this process, and getting where we are today to, to the official launch. You and team really did the, a great job um, in walking all of us through and launching the theme. So congrats to you. I think this is the first thing that I want and need to do. To uh, the audience uh, from the uh, ILO side, uh, you will hear a couple of colleagues. My name is Patricia. Um, then you will hear Monica and you will also hear Matt speak later on. And we have a fourth colleague, Margarita, um, who is also in the audience in case there are questions coming up. Those four of us have tried to accompany the um, process over the last month and try to pull out the experience um, that you in the audience actually have and compiled it in, in this theme. This theme also, as Amit mentioned at the beginning, perhaps if we had this conversation a year ago, um, we would not have had 132 people in the call. But these days, it is in the newspapers in our inbox every single day. And this is actually due to, to COVID. And uh, COVID reminds us that jobs, employment is such a fundamental thing in, in our lives. It's our professions through which we are actually defining a big part of ourselves. So uh, it is super important for ourselves as individuals, for our families, for the society, for the economy, for everything. I just wanted to share with you today, actually the ILO launched um, its latest COVID-19 monitor. And uh, I don't want to sound gloomy, but uh, when reading it, uh, we are actually uh, reminded and uh, pinpointed to the effects of, of, of COVID seem to be even worse than was previously um, feared, especially when it comes to, to labor income. And the current estimates suggest that the global decline in labor income has already been almost 11% in the first three quarters um, what we can see the data at the moment um, this year when we compare it to the same period last year. And the lower and middle income countries are actually even worse affected um, with a 15% drop. And women are even again more affected. And all of this is driven by a decline in working hours um, because of a closure of workplaces. And if you translate that, and a lot of you will be familiar with um, FTE measures, this already um, has translated into an estimate of 495 million FTE um, lost. So um, this doesn't sound very rosy. And unfortunately, the outlook is that these severe um, disruptions will continue um, at least until the end of this year. So this really is unprecedented um, times that uh, we are living through and uh, underscore the importance of the theme that we have been working on. Perhaps uh, we give you a tiny glimpse on what the ILO actually is. And thank you, Elisa, for <laughs> switching this slide. The um, ILO, the International Labor Organization, is actually one of the oldest uh, UN agencies. It precedes <laughs> the UN that is just celebrating its 75th birthday um, these days. The ILO was established uh, back in 1919. So we're 
101 year old by the Treaty of Versailles. And interestingly, the founding mission was, or the realization was that lasting peace can only be possible on the basis of social justice. Um, and this has been going through the ILO mandate since. Um, and uh, the vision of the ILO, as you can see in the slide, is basic decent work for all, which means that it's productive work for women and men and conditions of freedom, equity, security, and human dignity. So this is what we are all working towards too. And in pursuit of this vision, um, the ILO does basically three things. First, and this is probably what you know best, <laughs> is that the ILO formulates international labor standards. They come out through conventions or recommendations. But in addition, the ILO also provides technical assistance mainly to its constituents, the social partners, so workers, employers, organizations, and, and governments. And by the way, it's the only UN agency that has these tripartite structures um, and development partners. So technical assistance is also provided to development partners. And this is how also this collaboration here, the support to the GIN came about. One of the biggest pillars of this building technical assistance is actually training and capacity building. And this is what you see on the right side of the slide. The ILO has a training center that is based in Turin that is supporting this decent work agenda, providing learning and training to achieve um, SDG 8. And um, as part of uh, this broader decent work agenda and implementing it at the ILO. This is just one half sentence. The ILO has a, a program that is called social finance. <laughs> and this is the program in the ILO that basically does the collaboration with the financial sector. And this is the program that has uh, worked with you over these last few months getting all this work together. Perhaps Lisa, could you click? Um, the next slide, please. Perfect. <laughs> so maybe we don't really need to say much more here. All of you on the call and also beyond have contributed to the development of the theme. And it was more than 150 stakeholders. There's only a selection of those on the slide here on the June website. Everybody is basically mentioned. And a big thank you to you. Without you, this theme could not have come out. Um, today. And Lisa, next slide, please. And all these stakeholders were relevant for developing um, this impact theme, no matter if it was the investors, the researchers, the market builders, and others, because we need all these perspectives to actually come out for each theme, like quality jobs, with strategic goals that reflect the common aims that all of these different stakeholder groups have. So basically, this is what we did for the theme. Um, we tried to develop the strategic goals based on all your input, um, prepared an overview. Um, we looked at your advice, what you are actually already doing or what you can do in creating evidence and what data you can get from your investee um, companies. We tried to put this together in metrics and provided also a set of resources intact to the SDGs. So this is all that was done over the last month and we will walk you through this process now. Next slide, please. So picking up where Amit also already started off, why are jobs actually critical? Well, um, the global workforce is quite big, huh? so uh, 3.5 billion people. And for all of these people, jobs are so important simply for the fact that jobs provide income now, but also in the future. And not only for themselves, but also for their families independent family members. That's why jobs are so critical, but jobs are not always perfect. And I just want to pick out some things here. We see a lot of people are in the informal economy. 
two billion. So that's almost two thirds of the global workforce. And by being in the informal economy, they are not protected by social protection. They do not have all the, the labor rights. And this is an issue. Furthermore, one out of five workers basically is in working poverty. So they are working and working and working, but they are not able to make um, ends meet. Still today, 152 million children are employed as child laborers and half of them in hazardous conditions. So this is definitely something um, that needs to stop and needs to be eradicated. And what we see, especially now in the COVID times, young people, so the numbers that we have here, 21% of young people were, I would say now, were not in employment, education and training. And this number is increasing because especially now as part of the COVID effects, what we see is it is even more difficult for young people to enter the job market. And one last statistic um, on the gender pay gap across our region, it stands as 20%. Um, I don't think I need to say more here. So those are all elements of things in jobs that are a slight or a bigger problem. However, we cannot address everything at the same time. And that is why we look at this jobs dimension into three, in three elements. On the one hand, interventions can, or financing can go towards job creation, so more jobs. It can also aim at increasing access to jobs, making them more inclusive. And we can also focus on quality effects, um, earnings, skills, productivity increases, the better jobs. And this is what today the presentation actually um, is about. However, they are all interrelated. And the next slide, please, Lisa. So where we started off was looking at frameworks for quality jobs. And uh, believe me, there are quite a number of them. Um, with the working group, we decided to go for what you see on the right side here. It's actually a framework um, that dates back to 2015 um, that was uh, suggested by the ILO, UNECE and Eurostat as a statistical framework to analyze quality of employment. And it came up with uh, seven dimensions. And the working group distilled five of them and we listed them here. Um, improving job skills, improving health and well-being across the workforce, focusing on security and stability, especially for workers in precarious employment, improving earnings and wealth, and lastly, improving rights, respect and cooperation. So this is what the working group thought was the five most important strategic goals um, to put forward. I would like to add one very last sentence, and that is, what is underlying the quality jobs theme. We can always look at creating pure impact. However, it is important to consider when we talk of jobs and quality jobs, there is always an element of compliance. And this actually is the basis. And in the investment strategies, you can easily start off with compliance issues because positive impact can already be actually achieving this and then going beyond building on it towards a pure positive impact strategy. So we should always have this in mind. And this is where I want to stop and uh, hand over to my colleague, Matt, who will walk you through the first three strategies. Hey, thanks, Patricia. So I'm Matt Ripley from the ILO team, and I'll take us through the next few slides to give an overview of the first three strategic goals before passing you uh, over to my colleague, Monica. So this first goal is really about helping prepare the workforce for the rapid changes taking place in the work that people do. We know that advances in AI and robotics are already creating new jobs in some sectors and occupations and replacing jobs in others. And the shift to net zero as well will bring about transformations in demand for skills. And the ILO estimates actually that over one half of today's workforce at risk of uh, automation, a significant risk for lower skilled and vulnerable workers. 
So here in this strategic goal, investments can support opportunities for lifelong learning and, and reskilling, while also ensuring that new entrants to the workforce are equipped with relevant job skills. And this can lead to a number of positive impacts for workers, increased ability to find, grow and retain work, and improved career advancement opportunities. And together with the, the help of the expert contributors over the last few months, the core metrics we've identified, and you can see there on the right, along with some additional metrics, uh, core metrics we've identified around this goal were related to promotions and the number and types of workplace training initiatives. The next goal is about improving safety and health, as well as broader physical and mental well-being among all workers and their families. So, of course, keeping workers safe, healthy, satisfied and engaged helps to fill their potential and creates positive working environments and societal impacts. Investments aiming to improve workplace well-being can support companies that encourage fulfilling and meaningful work, as well as supporting innovations that can increase access to health and well-being services for workers and their families. And this, in turn, again, can lead to a number of positive impacts, including improved quality of life and improved mental health and well-being. And again, together with the expert contributors, the metrics identified for this goal at the core level range from having processes and policy in place to things like recording absenteeism and lost work days as a proxy for worker well-being. The next, the third goal, is about improving conditions for precarious workers, including contractors, casual workers and the self-employed, as well as those in the informal sector. Now here we know that the emergence of the gig economy and gig, gig and short-term work can create new employment opportunities and can provide flexibility for those who may have other responsibilities and, and can be more inclusive of certain uh, groups of workers. But we also know that insecure labour is, is associated with various other risks, including higher income volatility, lack of voice and representation, lower hourly wages and lack of social security. So investments under this strategic goal can drive impact by catalyzing new wage employment opportunities, particularly in formal enterprises, as well as supporting business models that favor stable and secure employment. And this can lead to another uh, a number of positive impacts for workers, including improved terms of employment and improved predictability of pay. And again, together with the uh, expert contributors, core metrics for this goal, you can see on the right-hand side, included things like the ratio of permanent to temporary employees, hours worked and wages. Monica, over to you for the other two goals. Monica, I don't think that we can hear you. Let me see if I can unmute you from my side. Okay, now. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So thanks. Hello, everyone. So we'll continue with the last uh, two strategies that we developed together with our stakeholders. So this one goes on about improving earnings and wealth through employment and entrepreneurship, specifically for disadvantaged, excluded and low income populations. So the topics that we treat here are wages, benefits, productivity, wealth building, and the idea is to help to ensure that every person can earn a living wage that helps their, them and their families to meet their needs and also to build, build longer ter term wealth and prosperity. Um, so the idea is that these through these um, strategic goals, we could have positive impact on uh, business performance, uh, earning opportunities and pay equity. Uh, and for this, um, we have decided on the core metrics that you see on the right. Um, you see there are many along wages, but we also see one on employees covered by collective bargaining agreements. What we have seen is that in companies where you have these collective bargaining agreements, they can negotiate, uh, workers can negotiate better wages. Um, so we can, you will see that they are, um, other additional metrics complementing this, um, but I would like to continue now with the last strategic goal that we have. Yeah, so our last one is related to improving rights, respect and cooperation in the workplace. So 
the topics that we are covering here are gender, race, ethnicity, equal pay for equal work, non-discrimination, worker's voice. So what we want is to improve worker engagement, worker voice mechanisms, improve transparency and support fundamental human rights. Uh, this is very important, as my colleague uh, said at the beginning, there are still a lot of children in child labor, half of those in hazardous child labor, and we still have uh, discrimination at the workplace. Sadly, this list goes on. Uh, so the idea, the impact that we would like to have is improve quality of employment and outcomes um, and more workers that are accepted and valued at the workplace. So if you see the core metrics on your right, these are more related to the policies um, and in the additional metrics, we have more metrics related to uh, measure the implementation of those policies. So it's very important for investors to engage in the implementation of those policies, which is the hardest part. So it's important that the investors support their investees into, into this. So in the interest of time, uh, I would stop here and then I will hand it over to Lisa. Wonderful, thank you. Um, it's my pleasure now to, to introduce Dr. Sam Lacey um, from the CDC group. Um, Sam, would you share a little bit more about how this theme resonates with the work that CDC does and how you'll, you'll use this theme moving forward? Hi, can, can you hear me okay? Yes, perfect. Okay, great. Um, thank you very much for, for inviting me to speak today, but also for inviting CDC um, and uh, a group of other European DFIs to participate in this, this process. Um, uh, we've re really appreciated being part of the process. Um, as a little bit of background, CDC is a development finance institution. In fact, it's the world's oldest development finance institution. Um, back in uh, 20 uh, back a couple of years ago we we had our, our birthday as the um uh, 70 70 years um <clears throat> of being in existence and i think for a dfi um a core part of how we drive impact is is through the jobs that we create um and we have always had labor rights as a core requirement that goes alongside the investment of our capital However, two years ago, and largely influenced by SDG 8, but also um, just because it was in, inherently, um, as many have said, a necessary complement to job creation, we created a job quality team to bridge the existing teams. So we already had um, an environmental, social and governance team, and a core part of their job is ensuring labor rights in our investments. We also have a development impact team, and a core part of their job is determining the kind of livelihoods impact of having different kinds of jobs in our portfolio and what that means for our development impact. So we have these two teams that look at job quality, and I think Patricia alluded to this, um, that job quality really bridges those two, that it's it's partly about risk and it's partly about ensuring that those worst forms of, of labor abuse don't happen but it's also about ensuring that a job enables you to work out of poverty and not get trapped in poverty. And so the creation of the job quality team um, enabled us to kind of bridge those two different perspectives and to try and bring together the win-wins for both business and workers of managing the risk and the opportunity um, side of, of job quality at the company level. Um, and for me, I think it's what makes this theme really interesting. I think the GIN process has resulted in these five really strong themes that capture the complexity of job quality, because when you first start to get your head around job quality, it is a complex array of things that make up job quality. And they also capture that spectrum from trying to prevent the worst forms of labor abuse right the way through to um, trying to build fulfilling jobs that enable people to progress in their lives. Um, so I think they've done a really good job of, of bringing all of that together. 
Um, I'm also speaking today as a representative of a group of European DFIs who have all collectively fed into the development of these metrics. And we really welcomed this opportunity that, um, that Jin and, and Iris Plus provided us with to work jointly with a broader range of impact stakeholders and with the ILO to, to feed into these metrics and to co-develop them. As DFIs, we normally try to harmonize our metrics and, and how we measure impact and manage um, ESG risk collectively among ourselves. But it's been really a really useful and interesting process for us to go through that with a much broader range of stakeholders and, and hearing those broader insights. So we really appreciate the effort that you made to kind of listen to our inputs and to involve us in that process. To your question around how we will use them, um, I think what we will do is review this this large suite of metrics um, as European DFIs and as CDC individually as well to see how they can help us with um, with three key areas. So the first area is at the whole portfolio level. So which metrics might we want to collect at the whole portfolio level to help us? measure and manage job quality across our portfolio and again going back to what i was saying at the beginning that's from two perspectives we want to be able to understand what the development impact is of the investment that we're making but we also want to um, use it for risk management to, to understand which companies in our portfolio we should be spending more time with um, to address uh, the risks and the flip side of that the opportunities of improving job quality in those companies so I think at the portfolio level, um, we want a very small number of metrics that we can collect that will help us do those two things. The second level of metrics that we want, and this would probably be a slightly larger set of metrics, is um, to track specific impacts that we have in investments that we've specifically made because we feel that that investment will make a particularly strong contribution to job quality. So for each investment, we might pick two or three key investment themes that are pertinent to what we're trying to achieve in that specific investment, whether one of those themes is, is job quality um, and potentially even job creation, um, what metrics do we want to track to evidence the impact we've had there? So we will be looking for those kind of metrics within this suite as well. And then the final, the third bucket is when we use, so we have um, a kind of grant funding facility called technical assistance that sits alongside our main investment capital that we can use when we feel there's an opportunity to, to do a project with a company that benefits the company from a commercial perspective, but also deepens our development impact. When we design a project like that with a job quality focus, we want to measure the effectiveness of that project. And so we also need metrics that can help us track how effective a project has been. And it could be a skilling project or it could be a, a project to improve the capacity of the HR team. Or, you know, there's all kinds of different job quality style projects, improving worker engagement and communications, for example. And we need metrics that will enable us to track the impacts that we've had when we do specific projects like that. Um, so yeah, so that's how we want to um, use them. And within the group of European DFIs, when we go back and reflect upon these metrics that we've helped to develop, um, the next question that we're going to ask ourselves is um, the same question that I'm outlining for CDC. How do we as a, a larger group of European DFIs want to use these metrics? And are there some that we all want to collect so that we can um, compare and contrast approaches between ourselves by having common sets of metrics. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you, Sam. Um, that was very, very helpful and I appreciate it. Um, from here, let's move on to, uh, to Vidya Chandi at Charity Ventures. Vidya, could I ask you to share uh, a little bit more along uh, the same questions, uh, but from your perspective? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Lita, and thank you, Jin and Ilo, for inviting us to contribute and also to present today. It's been a tremendous collaborative effort. Briefly about Chirati, uh, we are one of India's largest and oldest homegrown tech-focused VCs operating multiple sectors and have been ESG integrated for risk in two of our latest funds. 
The development impact thematic areas that we focus on are underserved, which include geo and segment, gender, NSME, and employment and employability. And therefore, this resonated very well with the quality jobs theme. We've recently put in place a framework to measure impact across our portfolio in our ESG integrated funds. And through measurement, we signal to our companies that impact matters. We also engage actively by improving governance in the companies as the first institutional investor in a lot of cases and help our portfolio companies grow through our industry expertise and connects to a large India LP base. At Chirate, we look at quality jobs through two lens, and in some sense, this speaks to the two levels that Sam was referring to earlier. The first is related to ESG screening and monitoring, where we adopt IFC, ILO, and CDC standards, and here all the strategic goals are of re relevance. Beyond ESG risk assessments and redressal, companies are asked to report on several aspects of employment, and we look at um, splits such as permanent and contractual employment, we look at gender, we look at youth workers, jobs uh, that are generated in tier two and smaller locations, number of women in leadership positions, as well as the number skilled over a period of time. And this includes skilling of employees as well as the primary supply chain. The second lens is the one that is specific to strategic goal three, which is improving earnings and wealth through employment and entrepreneurship. And these are specific to some of the investments that we have made. We believe it is as important to catalyze job creation by supporting local businesses as it is to safeguard and improve the quality of jobs. We invest in sectors that benefit small businesses or nano entrepreneurs to advance income generation and in turn create jobs across agriculture, logistics, micro mobility, small format retail, across lending, insurance, and demand aggregation and access to markets in different industries. And in this second lens, we track specifics related to the work that these investing companies are doing in terms of transaction volume, how many MSMEs are benefited, where are they located, and how many are female owned. So some examples of our investments are up on the slide, but overall, all of them are benefiting small businesses economically, and most are also working with them to standardize and upskill them. For example, Go Mechanic works with a network of local and independent auto workshops and help standardize their services, connect them to consumers, reduce spare part costs, which are then passed on as well to the consumer, and they help upskill their workers. Oil rickshaw is in the micro mobility space, connecting electric three-wheeler rickshaw driver owners with riders and planning to scale across India. Bayana Network very briefly facilitates faster invoice payment realization and supply chain financing at extremely lo low interest rates to MSMEs across 20 plus sectors in India and other geographies. Vizongo again aggregates demand for packaging and PPE suppliers and also facilitates technical assistance. And finally, Blowhorn in the intra-city logistics space offers market access and formalization for many truck owner drivers. These are just some examples of where we as a private sector are generating massive number of income and jobs and how we influence that and fill in for gaps in local regulations and labor laws. And with that, I'll hand it over to you, sir. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you very much. Um, from here, we will go on to question and answer. Uh, we've had a couple of questions come in through the chat box, so I will uh, start with those. And ILO, the first question that's come up is for you. Um, and it is, in the times of COVID-19, um, we see jobs disappearing uh, from a number of different contexts and a number of different ways. Why should we consider job quality and not job quantity when we're in these, um, these particularly difficult and high pressure moments? Thanks, Lisa, also for directing the question directly um, at us. I, I see there is a bit of a gender imbalance in the speaking minutes here. Um, so perhaps I just start and then I ask my colleague Matt to, to jump in here. Um, well, there, there could be a very long and a, probably a very short answer um, to it. Um, 
they are inter interlinked. Huh? So uh, quantity and quality of jobs surely is uh, is interlinked and without quantity you could actually say there um, is not even the basis for um, for 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 quality um, so first you do need to create a job um, that then also should be a quality job it is a chance in the building back conversation why should we build back something that will not be beneficial to people and to societies. Um, so it's answering a question with a question, Matt, do you want to um, add on more substantive thoughts to, to that? Well, really to echo that, Patricia, I think even before uh, the, the, the COVID pandemic, emerged there was increasing recognition that it you know, wasn't just about the number but also the quality of jobs that mattered to, to sustainable and inclusive growth in, in the long term um, and it wasn't necessarily particularly when you're looking at um, you know a problem in in emerging markets if not necessarily that you know people were always excluded from labor markets but they were often kind of adversely in, included in them so in often uh, times it's kind of low quality jobs are precisely what what keeps people locked into cycles of poverty. So I think, you know, um, something good from coming from something from very some, from something very bad is is that COVID is an opportunity to kind of build back with better jobs. And yes, of course, absolutely it's about quality and quantity, um, but an opportunity to kind of boost the quality of, of, of jobs as a, as a key kind of lens at which investors look at their, their portfolios and the, and the activities that they they do, um, recognizing that there is this interdependency, as you were saying, between the the, the qual job quality, job quantity, and job inclusion effects. Thank you. Um, we have a, a lot of questions coming in, which is great. Um, there are two that I'm going to cover very quickly from the gin side, and then um, uh, ILO team will send it back to you for a couple. Um, the two that have come up on our side are about what uh, some some more specifics on a specific metric, the wage equity metric. Um, and then a little bit more on how folks can can start using these metrics and, and start using the IRS Plus and navigating impact um, uh, system and resources a little bit more. On the first question, on specific metrics, um, the question around wage equity is about a, a relationship between different wages earned within an organization. Um, for any IRIS metric, uh, including all of those that are within the Navigating Impact project, um, if you go into the, the metrics themselves and, and click on the, the linked uh, code, it will give you a, a full deep dive into that particular measure. And so that will include um, what is the specific definition, what are the necessary footnotes, um, usage guidance on exactly how to get data and, and what other resources might be useful. Uh, and then of course the iris code which is how we uh, we help manage all of those standardization of different data points across the industry so would recommend that you go into the navigating impact project on these particular um this quality jobs theme and click into those metrics for further detail there um the other question is around uh advice on how these metrics can be useful and and how to engage with them more uh, I would recommend there, and we'll include this in the, the follow-up email we'll send, uh, I believe, tomorrow. Um, IRIS has spent a lot of time and a lot of um, uh, effort in bringing together the best practical how-to research, or, I'm sorry, how-to guidance uh, that we can find, um, and so and the, that we can develop. My colleague, Leticia, who's on the line, uh, drives that effort. Um, if you'd like to see more of that or get engaged with us uh, in, in some other way, you can click on the IRIS Plus um, website and go into the education tab, which gives you more on webinars and demos, and I'll, I'll talk about this in just a moment. Um, or you can go to the IRIS Plus Collaborate uh, page and let us know that you'd like to be involved, and I'll, I'll send that out via chat in just a moment. Um, Another question for the ILO team, and um, we probably have time for one or two more questions. Um, this is from Jens Anderson, and it's about a little bit more the distinction between compliance and more development-oriented dimension with relation to quality jobs. 
Um, what is, how do you think about the difference between uh, compliance and impact, as we refer to it, and, and how does this theme help with that? Uh, that might be for Matt, Monica, or Patricia, but I'll let you work it out. I'm always going for the gender balanced uh, voices. So, um, <laughs> Matt, do you want to jump in here? Thanks, Trisha. Yeah, happy to a uh, few reflections. And it would actually be interesting if, uh, from a best perspective, Sam, I know you've at CDC have done a, a lot of thinking on this. Um, so it would be good to, to kind of hear, hear a couple of seconds from, from you, if that's okay. Um, just say yes, you know, that was a, a, a core consideration that, that flowed throughout the, um, the expert consultations. Um, and, you know, what, what we were saying is, yes, sometimes there is a, a, a crossover between what might be a kind of more ESG or, or, or kind of um, um, a compliance metric and, and something that might be a more or, or, or an impact metric and sometimes they actually could you know fulfill both of the the, you, the same data point for both um, taking an impact lens in particular you, you might be applying actual portfolio to kind of look at best in class performers you might be looking at a, a kind of benchmark and seeing who's outperforming um, so so yes it's it, it's kind of a partly the, the metrics themselves and, and partly on how we use them and that's why in the core metrics um, very uh, importantly, what we've tried to do is have a mix of what we traditionally call kind of output level, so kind of the, the, the policies and processes that you might look at from a compliance perspective, but but also at the outcome level. So what is the effect of those kind of uh, policies and processes on, on, on people, on, on workers and their families? And we see a kind of a, an impact lens is certainly looking much more strongly at, at, at those outcome type uh, core metrics uh, in addition to the, the output level ones. Um, yeah, so I'll, go, I'll stop there. And if anyone else wants to jump in on that point, uh, please do go ahead. Um, hi. Um, yeah, so I think from an ideal perspective, we would like to find metrics. Sorry, this is Sam from CDC speaking. Um, we would like to find metrics that help us understand both the sort of compliance risk management side as well as the impact side, um, but recognize that you may not always be able to get metrics that help you with both. Um, where you, If you use a metric and you look at the delta, it depends on your approach. If you want to have a you know a sort of minimum standards and then after that it's all it's all impact or whether you want to invest in companies that are on day one really, really bad and look at the delta, look at the difference that you make. And so I think um, there's a lot of thinking that needs to be done beyond just selecting the metric about how are you gonna report it? Are you gonna report change over time? So the, the impact is that we improved from day one where, um, where there were lots of accidents or where there was no union representation or where there was a high proportion of, of um, uh, insecure work being used in the company and then a year later or two years later uh, those metrics have improved and then you're you're essentially using the same metric for two purposes that metric is is giving you an idea of where the risks are across your portfolio and help and by managing that um, that risk by by rectifying it from a sort of if you want a compliance perspective or an ESG perspective, then you are achieving an impact by doing that. Um, the other approach is you say compliance is a requirement for all our deals. Um, we're only going to look at impact beyond compliance. And so I think you can use the metrics that Jin have compiled in in either way depending on the context and also depending on the geography where you're investing. If you're investing in, in a Western context, then you would hope you should be able to take the core compliance stuff as a, as a relative given, um, and you should be able to focus on the beyond compliance impact value add piece. Um, but if you're investing, as we do often in rural DRC, then just getting someone to compliance is in itself an impact. Um, so I think I think what I like about this metric set, partly because it's so so large and so broad, is that you can use it in both ways. You can look at the delta, 
or you can just select the metrics that take you beyond compliance. I don't, I don't know if that helps. Thank you. In the interest of time, I am going to move us forward to next steps. Uh, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to get to all of the questions, but there were some really great ones. And um, if there are follow-ups, um, please feel free to reach out to us. I will actually chat right now um, a link for, for getting involved, but you can also use that to reach out to us on this particular uh, topic on, on remaining questions. Um, so next steps for this theme, and I've just chatted this collaborate um, link uh, in relation to this. After this launch today, what we will be moving forward to do with this quality jobs theme is to put it through a pretty deep standardization and public comment um, period. Um, so for those of you who are thinking about ways that this could better fit the work that you are doing or um, have topic areas or, or considerations that have not yet been included, um, please feel free to let us know that you're interested in being involved and we'll let you know exactly how you can provide um, comment and questions on what we've launched already. Um, after that process, we will um, be able to release it in Iris Plus. Two notes on that. Uh, one is that it will be released in Iris Plus in Q2 of 2021. So we do have a couple of months um, to really dive into the, the structure of the piece before we get it there. Um, and then also, as with all themes, the gin will treat uh, the quality jobs theme as a, a living good, effectually, uh, effectively um, which means that we'll be looking at it uh, as the industry grows and as new resources and learnings come out um, to keep it as up to date as possible as we as an industry figure out um, exactly how to how to approach different questions within this space. Um, the final point to highlight here is uh, is for more on Iris Plus and the GIN and the International Labor Organization's broader work. Um, for the GIN and Iris Plus and Iris Plus specifically, um, to join a demo, so to get a little bit more on Iris Plus and how it works, uh, hear about upcoming webinars or find guidance, all of that is available on the Iris Plus website. Um, we will also be, we've already released a couple of different evaluating impact performance studies diving deeply into how investors um, uh, are, are collecting data and, and what we can learn from that in the um, housing, clean energy spaces. We'll launch two new ones in October um, on financial inclusion and uh, agriculture. And big shout out to uh, our research team, Rachel Bass, Nova Notion, um, no, Notion Nova and uh, Sophia um, Sundarji on that piece. Building upon this quality jobs um, work uh, that, that many of you have contributed to you here, once we've launched this theme in Iris Plus, we will beginning, uh, begin collecting performance data and conducting analysis on the impact that investors have in quality jobs. So if you are interested in being involved in that process and um, and sharing uh, your thoughts, please do feel free to reach out through that Collaborate form as well. Um, we are currently building new themes on a number of different topics, a um, couple of them listed there. And of course, as Amit mentioned, we have an active uh, membership of about 320 organizations, might be a little higher than that. Um, and if you'd like to learn a little bit more about that, you can also check the GIN website. Um, on the ILO side, Monica, could I invite you to share a little bit more about um, your bullets here? It's Patricia jumping quickly in um, two bullets. As we mentioned before, the ILO actually does provide um, technical assistance to constituents, social partners and development partners. So reach out um, to us for technical advice on, on implementation of the strategies. There are two links here on innovative finance and sustainable investing. And the second bullet point is we are working on a white paper on, on quality jobs, um, the frame of impact investing. So stay tuned. Um, we hope this is coming out before the end of the year. And with that, thank you all for joining us today. Um, contact information for us here, and we look forward to hearing from you in the coming um, weeks and months on this topic. Thank you. Thank you all, and uh, have a good rest of the day.